Okay. We're going to aim to wrap up on time. So we have about 35 minutes for the panel. And uh, the way I'd like to sort of try to approach this is to, on one hand, have a lively discussion here, and, um, but approach it, the conversation along a couple of uh, dimensions. So we get the time dimension we're going to look at here, the near future is, let's say, five years, and then 20 years out. Uh, we're going to look at a, um, also at different technologies. We're going to consider the business angle. And ultimately, we're going to consider the sort of the, the impact uh, to end users, whether those are consumers and uh, or, or businesses. Um, we have a diverse perspectives here. You know, uh, Kalyan, the academic entrepreneur, and uh, Ben, the venture investor. Uh, we've heard from Dave from the, the BP, the oil and gas, and uh, we have a new uh, new face in the crowd, Tur Jakob Ramso, CEO of uh, Arundo, and uh, fellow Scandinavian. I'm, uh, I'm glad I, uh, the Olympics are over. I can stop seeing uh, Norwegians on the podium. I'm from Sweden, by the way, so. So you have to know the most important for Norwegians is not to win the Olympics, but to beat the Swedes. Yes, yes. And, and there, was a great, both. Uh, there was a great uh, silver medal by the Norwegians in uh, the men's uh, biathlon uh, relay. And uh, Sweden, of course, got the gold, so that felt, uh, felt good. For us Canadians, yeah. it's hockey, heavy sigh. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Um, and, and so, but the final perspective is you, right? So we're going to have active participation here. And so if you have a burning question that relates to what we're talking about, raise your hand and I'm going to throw you the, the catch box. Um, so, and, and so maybe I was thinking where we can start is a, perhaps a basic question. I've heard a number of different answers to this and we've touched on it, but it's around digitalization, digitization, digital energy. What, what does it really mean? What, what is it and what does it allow us to do? And uh, perhaps, you know, Dave, you can sort of summarize um, what it is in a nutshell. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think maybe a simplistic uh, way of looking at its, its impact to us. As I said, we kind of have this notion of digitization in pockets in a company, but we've never been really exploring our operations significantly. We've been acquiring data and we've been running operations in traditional sense. But let's extrapolate what we heard about the data collection process. Let's extrapolate what we heard about the AI routines and the cognitive. Uh, and let's presuppose then that we could actually have AI routines that could ingest all that data. And this is something we call the digital twin. So every aspect of our physical facility all captured digitally in real time, in near time, whatever. So imagine what could happen if you have all of that data and then you can run it through simulator routines, heavy processing, which is one of the reasons why we're interested in quantum. So uh, in terms then of uh, uh, a possibility is we could actually operate in the future. I could collect all that data. I could be running simulations that project anywhere from 30 seconds in the future to 25 years in the future right down to my subsurface things. And I could make a conscious decision, including economic factors, and I could make a conscious decision then of how to turn that valve. That's a radically different thing than a first principle approach of just worried about a pressure change. And, and that, I think, is something we, we haven't yet really understood. Is that a possibility? We think the trajectories are there. But I think that is one dramatic change to what we could see. Right, right. Anyone else want to take a stab at that? Kalyan, you looked like you wanted to say something. Okay. Um, so at some level, it sounds like you've been dabbling in a couple of approaches, but now this, this, uh, the, the way you're describing it allows you to perhaps uh, abstract and understand at a higher level what digital allows you to do. Um, and perhaps one question for Arundo here. So you, you're, um, we've heard sort of the corporate perspective, but the startup perspective, as you're starting to work with these big operations, these, these big yeah. companies, what are you seeing as a startup and in, in, in where their strengths and their weaknesses are when it comes to uh, digital operations? So um, actually also following up a little bit what you said, David, I think it's a big paradox, at least in the oil and gas industry, because you invented big data 30 years ago. I think you mentioned it also. You had more seismic model, you had more GPU, you had more storage than any industry in the world, but you've probably been the slowest one to adapt into, into what's happening now with IoT, cloud computing, that was 
dangerous and scary, but, but now we are all into it. So, so I think what we see as a startup is um, you're still setting the pace. I think it's still going a little bit slow, but everyone is focusing on how this is hitting the, the large operators like the Shell and the Exxons and the BPs of the world. But just think about when BP is putting an oil line, a platform, new oil platform offshore, they may have 3,000 sub vendors. Those are going to be hit so much harder because you still, you control the resources, you will need energy if it's wind or oil or how it's produced, that's going to shift, but that's a different dialogue. But the whole vendor market is going to be hit much, much harder, actually. And currently, the focus is very much around what BP and the Shells is doing. But if I'm a pump manufacturer, no one wants to buy a pump, or you don't want to buy a pump. You want to buy pumping. So they are really going to be hit by the digitalization much harder than anyone else. So what we see, it's a, it's a big opportunity, and we just started to exploring into it. We just realized they will go slow. They're moving with glacier speed, and they're deciding, they, because they have these multi-billion budgets. And the oil price is back on 70, and, and it, it, it's, it's a good time for, again. But if I'm a mid-sized pump manufacturer, they don't want to buy the pump. They want to buy the pumping. It needs to have a digital operating system. That's what we see is very, very interesting, how that's going to happen. And then what I would like to engage in a dialogue with you on, David, is how could we do make that smarter together? Because if you're a mid-size, so GE, they spent 4.9 billion to develop Predix. Some people is still questioning how it's working. But 4.9 billion, if I'm a mid-size spent manufacturer, I can't spend 4.9 billion to build a digital operating system. Ben, do you want to have anything to say? Um, yeah, I think the, the, the only thing that, that I'll add is... Um, you spend more? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, is, um, you know, I think, I think digital energy and, and providing digital solutions is, uh, is two parts. There's the data piece, and, and there's more data becoming available, and, and that's incredibly valuable. But it's only incredibly valuable if you can distill it down, and I think there's... Um, there's a lot of effort out there to turn data into insights because that's what customers really care about. They don't care about, you know, whether you're sampling their, their pump at, you know, once every day or once every second. Um, it's really how does that help me improve my operations? And so delivering digital technologies through, through again, I go back to, to business models that are really providing insights and and value to customers is is really what's going to drive, continue to drive value there. Okay. Uh, yeah, if you hadn't, if you want to add something. Uh, no, I, 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 I yeah. so my work is actually to turn data into insights or predictive models. And uh, I actually, ten, uh, 12, 12, 13 years ago, I started a GE um, as an intern. Um, and I think uh, from that perspective, and when we try to build these models that you know, either derive insights from the data or we try to build something that's predictive and try to use that, I think one of the things that we are finding is uh, a lot of that work has been traditionally approached uh, both in academia and in industry as a sort of what we call discovery first paradigm. So when we have data, we don't even know uh, whether it can predict something. So we try to make that as, a, as, a, as the first goal. Can we, can we test that? Can we see if it, if it works? And that's what we do, uh, what we call a discovery paradigm. And then we write a paper or a blog post, and the industry has now adopted that, that they write blog posts about it. But 99% of those things are not actually getting deployed for several reasons. First is uh, many a times it's not closely, those things are not designed by keeping the end user in mind. So they're not being developed to actually deploy. So they're not actually, you know, they're, they're making cool discoveries, but we don't actually know if that's actually a, usual, a useful discovery that the end user wants. Mm -hmm. uh, simple things like, uh, do we predict something four weeks ahead or two weeks ahead? That makes a huge difference business-wise. Doesn't make a huge difference discovery-wise. As long as we are able to predict, we are okay with it. We can claim that we made a prediction using the data. So I think we, we are finding a lot of those challenges uh, in terms of when we take something to practice. Machine learning or AI solutions that are built on the data we discover something and we take them to practice, that translation has not been easy. Mm -hmm. I, I think if we could follow up on what you said, that's a little bit what we saw was the biggest problem. We see a lot of great data science who's dying in PowerPoint. So it's, uh, it's not that people are able to make smart models, but 
how, how do you deploy it? How do you get to work? That's actually one challenge. The second challenge is how do you change someone who's a maintenance engineer who has been operating on the same SOPs for the last 20 years? That's probably one of the biggest obstacles you, you, you have because uh, uh, if, you don't, if you deliver machine learning in a black box, why should I trust it? I don't even understand what's going in. I don't understand even less what's happening in that black box. And the only thing that may going to happen is um, you would have an autonomous production in the, in the future. So I'm, I'm just going to go away. So I'm very symp sympathetic to the challenges you have to, to digital transform, but uh, very interested to hear what you're saying about that. One of the things that has come up from, from a lot of angles is uh, access to data, right? And we, we talked about it, everyone mentioned it, but uh, what about data ownership and, and especially uh, when you start dealing with the subcontractors that the number of subcontractors that you have uh, and as you start working with in academics and startups um, how is that changing Are you, is your view and sort of the, your sense of the value of that data changing and your willingness to share it yeah I think it, I think it needs to change uh, to follow on what Tor is saying I think there's there's quite a disruption going on right now in uh, kind of the service umbrella around the energy core. Uh, in, in your example of the pump manufacturer is just that. Uh, we're seeing that in the inspection community. We're seeing the contracts. If you actually examine the data flow, we usually only get insights from these people because that's the way we contracted. We only wanted the answer. Now, because we're able to use these kinds of new routines, we actually don't know what data is going to be useful. So I think for the next few years, our real challenge is that we want everything. We don't know yet what to, quote, throw away because we don't yet know if an AI routine will find something valuable about that piece of data. So there's two things. One is about access now to some of the raw sensor data that we didn't ask for in the past or, or were you know, considering. And, and we need to now have access to that. And then we have to take a look at uh, our ability to um, work with new data sources from new sensor types. So I think we're going to find some intriguing new insights as to what's going to give us a better prediction. And I think it's going to be new sensor types. I think we are, are only exploring on what we know are the current ones. So we're you know working with thermal and IR and we're working with with uh, uh, visual a lot, but we're we're still not doing a lot in hyperspectral or other parts of the spectrum or acoustics or any of those places, which is all I think valuable data about what we're doing. Um, I think just one other direction that to go back to your original question was um, that we haven't yet talked about what do we see as new business models. So I like what, what you were saying because we're exploring in these disruptions, which occur to us as well, the electrification and EVs, what does that do to our energy models and then what does it create for us for new ones. So I spoke about what we see five years from now in, in the space of our traditional or uh, normal kind of operations, but there's this whole branch of what else could we be doing that's in energy, but in digital energy in a different way than just uh, liquid hydrocarbon. Um, so if, you th if we think about the, the challenges of da data, uh, of, of making that valuable and, and successful and useful within an enterprise, w what are some of the, you know, if you had to name just three keywords sort of the, the key challenges or the key requirements for success, what would, you, what, what would those be? And I'm going to start with Kalyan over there. And oh. <laughs> you got to <laughs> stay nice to hear their perspective. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's see. <laughs> then, then, then do that. Uh, uh, I think one of the big challenges that I, when I work with enterprises, is uh, the sort of a shift in mentality. They have to shift now from investing a lot of res into research and discovery then actually saying that let's figure out what the end use cases and business cases and go deployment first. We have enough technology in machine learning. We have enough to actually address the needs of the industry for what data they have. We don't have to innovate you know, huge amounts of new, new machine learning algorithms and machine learning models right now. So that's, my, that's the first thing that I, I, I find very interesting is that uh, Companies are investing millions and millions of dollars in R&D efforts, but going for actual, when it comes to implementing a machine learning solution to bid for business value, they're going to startups, or they're going to outside vendors, or they're going to the universities, and they're going to coming to the consultants, um, which, is, which I feel is just very, you know, it's completely, uh, that needs to shift. 
um, the hype actually <laughs> is a is a like I mean numerous times I get asked about to talk about what is what is hyped up versus to talk about that they have a data store so they have a classic way that I get approached is that we have this data source and nobody is making a use of it and it's just lying there we need to make it valuable and I turn around and I say okay let's make it valuable so let's let's do it oh can you tell us about deep neural networks I'm like no <laughs> That doesn't, uh, there is no, that, that doesn't apply to your data, just by the way, just so you know. So I think that's one of the big challenges for enterprises is to overcome the hype, realize that there is already technology that can be put to use, uh, target your resources directly to address that. So I think, I yeah. think that's my. Let's go to Ben. Uh, you, you asked for three, three words. Uh, uh, two, yeah, um, one, two, three. I, I sort of go to fundamentals. Uh, I mean, you've got to understand that the data is val valid. Right, it's it's correct data. If you're not analyzing correct data or accurate data, then then you're wasting your time. Um, and then I think it's getting down to useful data sets, understanding what is what is valuable data, doing the work to figure out if a certain data set is valuable. If it's not, lots of them aren't. Um, then then move on to the useful ones. Um, and then I think it's not necessarily a, a determiner of success, but I think there is this open versus proprietary data sets and where, where you make the decision to keep it proprietary, where you make the decision to open it up on an anonymized basis um, for sort of the broader benefit of the ecosystem and the, and the analytics, um, and where you just open it up completely um, and allow people to see it. Um, yeah. I very much agree in the two you said, Karen, that, that uh, it's, it's not about having the latest deep learning. It's just that deep learning doesn't fit for everything. Uh, it's very good to identify cats and dogs and stuff like that, but probably not to fix your problems. But uh, but uh, so so the, the data science exists. That's not the challenge. Uh, it's uh, why we chose uh, oil and gas first is because it's super sophisticated in instrumented. Even a 25-year-old uh, oil rig has 25,000 tags. The problem is actually the only thing that they get access to is less than 5%, because you never know where the data is ending. It's ending in some kind of a black box, and no one has realized this as value. So, so if you, when you are doing your models, if you could get access to that, you have a big advantage to, to the other ones. So, so I, th I think then my third one is, is, is probably, we shouldn't underestimate what I was trying to address, a little bit the human nature and the resistance of change and, and who is uh, operating in asset heavy industries. And we also hearing a lot you using regulators as an excuse to make the change, but, but literally it could be a facilitator. If you talk to the regulators, they just want to make sure it's safe. And if you could document it's even safer by doing this, it's no problem. Yeah. Dave, anything to add? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll just, just keywords. Trusted insight. Trusted insight. Yeah. And so it, it, it's less about the data, it's about understanding um, what insight is given from the data. So it's not about always collecting more data, because that just may not do anything to the signal noise ratio, that just may be collecting more data. So it's kind of understanding a bit. I think, Tori, you were kind of, you used this language a little bit. You have to understand a bit more about how those algorithms are handling that kind of data, mm -hmm. which data makes sense. So I have a bit more of a directed data acquisition process. So. And then I trust the insights out. So uh, uh, again, it, it's to say if it states this is the kind of anomaly and it only has, you know, six months to go, you've got to, you want to trust it there. Mm -hmm. uh, the other word I'll use is cognition. So a little bit contrary to what the guys are saying here, our job is to look that much further in the future, five, ten years out. So I, I agree with what you guys are all saying about what can we do here and now, but we're also trying to say five years from now, will I have cognition capabilities to add to? The trusted we insight. Have the capabilities well, yeah. that depends we on your view. We can actually build the uh, systems yeah, that do. But do well, you said I didn't need to build you any more. You just have to give us access. <laughs> you just have to give us access to the data and you not said distract I didn't us. Have to build anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you see. <laughs> so, so let's uh, let's take a poll here from the audience and see what keywords here resonate with people. So I think we had uh, sort of clean, valid, useful data. Uh, are those is that a challenge that people are seeing? And you don't have to just pick one of the ones I'm going to mention. Just just raise yeah, raise your hand. Dealing with that, absolutely over there. Uh, sort of what about the sort of the, the mentality and the human culture 
in terms of you know implementing a digital strategy, making making value out of that. Yeah, a couple of hands. Yeah, all around. Um, trusted insight. So it's not not about more data, but making sense of it, I guess. Yeah. Right. Um, cognition, <laughs> cognition <laughs> versus uh, we have it. We already have the or access to data, I guess, right? So those are the two challenges. All right, no one, no, no one get, got that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, something, um, something that a lot of startups wonder about is, you know, how do you work effectively with uh, the bigger companies, right? It's, it's a question I asked, asked the startups, tell me what, what you want to, uh, what kind of questions you want to ask. Um, and so they, they always ask, how do I work effectively with a big corporation? Uh, because, you know, especially in this industry, you're different in clock cycles, you know, five to 10 years for you, a startup is maybe five to 10 months or, or five to 10 weeks. Um, any advice on that front in terms of what you've seen work really well? And you know, I wanna hear from Ben as well as, as Dave. Maybe Ben, you, you start out. Sure, um, it's hard. Uh, big companies are, are tough. Um, they're big, they're slow, um, they're risk averse. Uh, it just, in comparison to, to, a, to a lean startup that's six people trying to build a business, um, it's just, we operate at different scales and different speeds. That's, that's partly what we're uh, at GE to do, is to serve as that conduit between startups and, uh, and the industrial businesses uh, within GE. Um, we serve as sort of a constant reminder to our business units that there's a different pace operating out there in terms of innovation, uh, and they need to they need to start working towards that. And we've got certain individuals within our business units that are that are dedicated to working with early stage companies, and and they understand that, and it's it's improving that process. The other thing that always gets a big company's attention is is customers and revenue. If you can come in with a customer or a revenue generating opportunity that you can work with a company on, that always gets the the ball rolling faster versus saying, hey, you have a technology, we have a technology, this is how we think they could work together. What's, yeah. the, what's the outcome? What's the right. customer I mean, outcome? Traction, right? Yeah. So, but but I'd, I'd like to just push back a little bit. And I, I often see, you know, so I work with a lot of startups here at MIT and, and they'll have traction and they'll have a great technology. Uh, and and sometimes it, it just the feels like the big company is not able to they don't even have a process internally to deal with startups, right? So they might have an innovation team and uh, th that gets them through the pilot, but then there's nothing happening after that. There's no plan beyond that. And so I'm just curious, like, w what advice would you have for those kind of corporations? Uh, for the large corporations? Yeah, like yeah. how do they improve uh, that profit? Uh, yeah. you, have to, you have to invest in it. You have to invest in working with early stage companies. It's not, uh, it is a two-way street. It's not like there's a map to work with a big organization. There, there has to be another corresponding map on the other side that says, how do I work with an early stage company? And I think we've, we've developed that at GE. And, and I'll be honest, there are business units that are better at it than, than others. And there's some that are coming up the learning curve. So um, we definitely push that forward as an, as an innovation organization within GE and an external facing organization um, to really help drive that. I think having programs that uh, engage with startups, we do, um, we call them demo days, but bring in a bunch of companies to our business leaders. They're all in the room at the same time. It would be an event a lot like this with just GE folks in the room um, to get them exposure to, to entrepreneurs and innovators and then there's, there's follow ups that come from that. Um, we sort of try to immerse it as much as we can in the culture of the of the business units. Yeah, Dave, anything you want to add? Uh, well, I, I certainly agree with Ben. I think it, it's a real challenge for companies like ours to do it. Um, I think we've retackled some of that. Uh, Sean over there uh, is part of our venture, so we've actually re-examined how we do ventures. We stopped it for a while, quite honestly, and I think we're re-examining under the light of, of digital innovation. We're getting more more traction with them. Uh, I think one of the challenges we always have as a large company is, is, and I'll go back to our remit, which was scalable solutions. And your challenge is in some of the startups, what we can offer is subject matter expertise. Mm -hmm. What we can offer is an assessment to say, actually, this is market capable. We could um, 
uh, see value out of it, we could start leverage value, we could start to consider what would be the actual business case of doing it. What we're not in a position doing is saying, you're going to be our sole provider. You, we can't strike large contracts for you with you because you can't scale to our place. You, you have to be ready at a certain size in that startup to say we actually could adopt this across the board. So from the kind of the, the way our mission is now in our, in our company, that's going to be probably one of the, the biggest things. We could find something quite good that says market technically is ready, but business-wide you're not ready to scale with us, therefore it's not ready. And, and I think that'll be a challenge. I think the, adding one more thing is you have to get uh, stakeholders in the business units comfortable with the sort of risk profile of early stage companies and working with them. Um, they're used to programs that are big programs that have a high rate of success versus us in venture. Most of the companies in the portfolio don't aren't successful, right? That's the nature of, of early stage innovation. And so getting people to understand that and accept that is key to um, to initiating those those engagements and then understanding that it's a long-term game. Right. Just want to, yeah, let's take a question here. I'd like to ask a question about when you can engage. Um, for, so for example, I see a lot of activity around blockchain in this town. Oh, I thought we were um, and and <laughs> it seems to me that a lot of them don't really know what they're doing with it, right? Uh, they, 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 they don't see the, the right application, but they're still building something with blockchain. In this town. In this town. But I'm sure it's the same everywhere else, right? But, but it, could be, it could be very helpful for startup companies if... if GE or BP would come in and give them some advice, the domain expertise on the kinds of problems they see that they could imagine could be solved with a blockchain. So that would be before the demo day, you know. It's, it's, but but because there are 50 startups that are trying to do something, you know, and if, if they got some guidance, would you be prepared to do that kind of thing? Or where, or more generally, where do you see the right moment of engaging with startups? Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give an answer to that right now. So we actually belong to a number of consortia, and that's the approach we're taking. As you say, there's a lot of experimentation going on in this space, a lot of use cases being derived. But rather than working with an individual startup, we're working through the consortia model because we think we can leverage all that because people are using different aspects of implementing blockchain or executing it. And we see some startups based on this technology in blockchain or that. And so we've, we've chosen to kind of broaden it at this point in an experimentation phase. But I think it's what Ben was saying. At this point, because we believe there could be something quite significant there, but no one knows what it is yet, uh, it is experimentation. This is a new model for us where we are investing time and effort and money to explore that and come out. So that's going back to what you were pointing out. It's not something BP would have done five years ago is what I'm suggesting to you. And I think we're now recognizing we need to do more of that. But uh, in terms of specifically blockchain, yeah, we actually have quite a bit of activity going on in the experimentation phase. All right, and maybe I'll just answer your question as well from, from my perspective. So for ILP members, they can post these kinds of challenges or opportunities, we call them on our website, where they're looking for startups to solve specific use cases. And that's, that's proving to be starting to show some good results, right? So it, it, it can work that way. Um, what about renewables? I mean, so building on the decarbonization theme here, uh, is, is digital different there? Is it less of a problem? These are, you know, some, somewhat newer, less complicated uh, devices in comparing a, an oil rig versus a wind turbine. Um, is it different or is it? It is different. Yeah. Because an oil field is maybe put in production 40 years ago and you just made a new 40 year plan. So, so how would you make that digital? How would you create a digital twin uh, versus that uh, and you have 25, 50,000 sensors and you, you don't know how to get access to it. But a wind turbine, it's 15,000 or 1,500 sensors and it's new. So, so it's actually it's easier and it's fewer parts who is integrated. So uh, at least on what we are doing, but someone could probably say it's much more complicated on other stuff, but uh, just the equipment part is easier. Yeah, I agree on the equipment side. I'll say that with renewables, um, you know, these are intermittent resources and predicting those resources uh, becomes a new challenge. Um, you know, cloud coverage, uh, wind profiles, et cetera. Um, 
solar is a solid state device. There's not a lot of moving parts there. Um, maybe a tracker, but um, a wind turbine is a slightly more complicated device, but nothing compared to, to a gas plant. But I think coordinating those assets, understanding when generation is going to be coming from one region, when it's coming from another, is a problem that can be solved with, with digital solutions and, and simulations and analytics. Yeah. Yes. The whole ecosystem is much more complicated than renewable. Uh, so you can't only look on the equipment. You need to look on the grid. You need to look on the financial market. Are you going to have a forward or swap or whatever? And, and how should I bet? And what's my energy mix? So, so it's the whole integration, but the equipment part is much easier. But the ecosystem is much more complicated. All right, let's, let's go to the long term here. And so 20 years from now, let's say, um, and, and let's imagine a blank canvas and, and try to um, paint what the future will look like. And uh, you know, BP has the LTTV, long-term tech vision. Yeah. What, wh how do you even think about technology that far out? I mean, AI, is that gonna be a thing then? Or is it, are we onto something else? And Well, at this point, we think it's AI and cognition. I'm sorry, I'm gonna bring that word up I don't <laughs> for it. But uh, um, I think we can't do it as just technology, it's not just the LTTV as we call it, but it, um, I would uh, hope you guys look at our energy outlook, because that actually is one of the fundamental drivers of how we look and choose technology as well. And that was a, a new marriage we brought together. So we, 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 we predict on where we think the energy sources are and, and that whole bit, and I think we're, we're known for that. That's always on our BP.com website. And we use that a lot to inform us about, about these long-term technology views and say, actually, where is it better for our investment profile? So we are talking about uh, uh, peak oil, surprisingly. What is peak oil demand, not peak oil supply? So we said, actually, there's no such thing as peak oil supply yet, from our view. There is peak oil demand. So we kind of are looking at the energy equation and say, where is energy going to be consumed? It's a lot of what Ben was talking about with the grid. Uh, what's electrification going to do to us? Where are we actually going to put hydrocarbon energy into play versus where are we going to put uh, electrical produced by wind or solar into play or biofuels? So we look at all of those to help us say, given the energy equations, where we think the balance is, that it helps inform us on what technology do we think may help us for that. Mm -hmm. But okay, so let me ask this, ask the, the question slightly different. Let's think about experiences that we're going to enable in the future. And so let's not be tied to technologies or, or, or uh, making predicting the future based on current data. Let's just try to picture something completely new and different. And so what is that, what does the experience and the future feel like, look like, smell like, or uh, whatever? Who wants to go first? No, I, uh, I, th I think you will not find a solution as only focusing on one installation or one set of equipment. I think the solution where we really could get leverage is a little bit what we talked about in the renewable, how you could think about the whole energy value chain and what your energy basket looks like and, and where's the future demand, where's the future supply and, and how do you match towards that. But I think it's also a challenge how do you find a good balance between realizing a use case tomorrow versus or today versus only planning for the next five years. Mm -hmm. Oil companies are very good thinking five, 10, 20 years. All right. um, I don't know if I have a good answer to the question, but I think uh, one thing we'll have to think about as we plan 20 years out is, is infrastructure in general. You think about the sort of technology adoption cycles and they're constantly, constantly compressing, but we're still building infrastructure that's 20 year, 30 year, 40 year life infrastructure. And you know, I go back to mobility and think about a parking garage that might be built, you know, tomorrow, yeah. and they underwrite it with a whatever multi-decade life of a parking garage, and then all of a sudden technology catches up, and there's n there's there's no cars to park in that garage because we're using fewer cars, and they're all autonomously driving around. Uh, I think that's a that's a problem. We're going to have to think about how we flexibly uh, design and, and build infrastructure. Uh, to be able to adapt with the technology developments that are coming. I think on the energy side, you know, you could picture a world that um, is just increasingly more and more getting closer to 100% renewable generation and, uh, and what that means for the world. Um, that's it. Kelly? Cool. Um, so you, you said uh, 20 years from now, yeah, what can years. we imagine? I yeah. think 
I think uh, if you were to imagine, I think AI, I can speak from AI's perspective and maybe the, its intersection with energy, but it will become more programmable. So I think people will be able to build their own AI systems for their own purpose. Right, right now it's very centralized. Uh, enterprises trying to build AI systems to make predictions for people. Uh, but it's not people who are actually, uh, you know, trying to use the data and build predictions for them. So I think that will start to happen, just how we can now de on demand ask a car. We can on demand design a prediction problem that we are interested in, and we should be able to, you know, use the data to make that prediction for ourselves. And it may not be of interest to anyone else, but it's something that we want to predict ahead. Okay. Any questions from the audience? So um, I run a low-cost energy startup here in uh, Cambridge, and my question is for the whole panel, but mostly for BP and GE. Um, you guys are historically known as large capital-intensive projects, big safety, reliability, that kind of stuff. Uh, if the shift goes to distributed energy and we actually see that, that take place and sort of overcome the, the generation and sharing and economy, and it becomes sort of an Uber-like, capital-like endeavor, uh, do you see a, a complete shift within your organizations uh, from a actual physical product, which as a techie I like, uh, to a completely sort of virtualization system in which you're going to monetize or capitalize or, or become a player in that? Well, I, I think there will be a shift. So uh, I'll, I'll say there will be uh, a, quite, a, quite a shift in, term, in terms of how much is the virtual energy placed. I think from a physical size, though, one of the models we've been looking at is sh should we go to some more local refining? Remember, a lot of the, a lot of the reason we're the size we are is, is that old model of you know, scale gives you, gives you low cost. And uh, so the start, so could we possibly see from the energy shift our infrastructure being more localized and small refineries, even family-sized refineries in rural areas, for example, as opposed to turbine, is that a possibility? Those are things we're, we're considering. Yeah. Other questions? Ben, did you remember? Yeah, I'll just say, to answer that one real quick, for, for GE's perspective, I think it'll be an evolution. I think there will be certain technologies that, that we've got a <clears throat> differentiated solution that we'll continue to maintain, um, and then working with other best-in-class technologies to, to best optimize the network, I think will be the solution that prevails. But it will be a, an evolution and a shift from, from our business model now. Yeah. If I, as a Norwegian and startup, could answer, 50% uh, of all cars in Norway, new cars, are EVs or uh, chargeable cars. So not 2%, 50%. And it literally happened immediately. I know, uh, because we've been working with one of the large majors, they are using Norway as the example, they expect it's not going to be sold any gas line in 10 years. Literally nothing. So, so that's, uh, it's, the future is here. It's, it's probably not going to be an evolution. It's probably going to be a revolution. Igor. Um, so as we talk about uh, evolution of energy markets in general, I think it's important for us to talk about utilities and what role do you guys see them play uh, as we go forward, um, do you see them downscaling in their role? Do you see them taking on a more, you know, more all-encompassing role? And in general, how do you see them interacting with the future market? I think you're seeing different utilities do different things. Um, they're definitely uh, their core business model is threatened by by what's going on. You see a lot of. Uh, the progressive utilities in Europe uh, moving into behind the meter applications and getting more involved in the assets that are going in behind the meter. Um, look, the, the wires are never going to go away. We're never going to be in a world where we can install solar and a battery in, in, a, in one location and just run off of that. It just, there's not a, there's geographies where that doesn't work and there's instances uh, where people live and work that that doesn't work. So the, the wires are never going to go away. There needs to be a system operator uh, and I think that's a role that utilities will continue to fill, uh, but they, they are changing. The progressive ones are changing. Uh, okay, so I, I promised I'd uh, try to end on time. We're just slightly over here. Uh, so I think we're gonna call it a day for now. Um, before we thank the audience, I wanted to point out a few things. Uh, just remind you of upcoming um, events we have. The ICT conference in mid-April, the flagship event uh, mid-May. And then we'll be back here for, for um, ag tech in June. And uh, beyond that, 
you know, thanks so much for coming. There's going to be a survey going out probably next week, so pre please answer that and let us know how we can improve. Uh, let's uh, join me in, in thanking the, the panelists.